Hello, everybody, um, and welcome to um, our seminar today. We are talking about student mental health and what is a university's duty. Um, I'm Emily Formby. I'm delighted to welcome you all to um, our webinar. Um, I'm joined by Steve Broach and Ian Brownhill, and together uh, we will be talking um, about the High Court decision in Aberhart and the University of Bristol. Um, we are... Um, going to be outlining the case, um, Abrahart, uh, which is a citation of 2024, um, EWHC 299. Uh, we're going to give an outline of the case and what happened. Uh, it's an appeal to the High Court, so that's the case that we're going to be talking about. Uh, and Steve's just going to be in control of the slides. You will be able to download these um, and view them at your leisure later. Uh, so starting off on the first slide, we're going to give you an outline of the case and what happened. Uh, as I said, the appeal was to the High Court. Uh, we're looking at the statutory tort under the Equality Act 2019. Steve's going to talk about that. And in particular, the reasonable adjustment in disability discrimination claims. We're going to look at civil liability and relevance of common law tort. I'm going to lead on that. And then Ian's going to wrap up with inquests and the potential impact. So potentially, um, sorry, pre predominantly um, looking at the Equality Act. And this is a reflection and interactive discussion. So we hope that you will... Um, ask us questions on the Q&A and we'll try and answer them as we go along um, or if we can't or there's not enough time we'll answer them later. Grab a cup of tea or whatever you feel like um, and let's begin and go through this claim. Now of course as always with um, um, these, these matters it's important to reflect that this is actually a case relating to the tragic death of a young woman Natasha Abrahart. She was only 20 when she took her life on the 30th of April 2018 and it was the day that she was due to make a presentation um, to other students and academic um, members um, of her group as part of her university course um, and it was an assessed talk that she was meant to give um, and it's assumed that the prospect of that was so overwhelming to her um, that she took her life rather than make that presentation. Now we'll obviously we'll be looking at the, le the legal import of the case and the importance um, of what it may or may not tell us in relation to other claims. Obviously from a legal viewpoint um, that's important but you can't do other than grieve for the loss of life and feel nothing but compassion for her and indeed acknowledge the devastation that her death has brought to her family and all who knew her. Um, one thing it is perhaps important to reflect upon, um, we are obviously looking at suicide in the context of tertiary education, um, that although suicide is um, a growing problem, um, it's actually a problem for young people in every area. Um, and while um, the campaigning may not be um, as clear around um, other areas of life, in fact, university statistics are um, uh, statistics show that being at university or in tertiary education is in fact a protective characteristic. The suicide rate for young people of those at, in tertiary education is lower than in the general population cohort. But nonetheless, in terms of looking at this case and the outline of the case, as I say, she was 20 at the time um, of her death. She was a student at Bristol University. She was in the second year of an MS, um, a, a Master of Science degree. The programme was predominantly in physics. Um, she had a diagnosis of depression and social anxiety order, which amounted to a disability for the purposes of the Equality Act 2010. This meant that her ability to participate in oral assessments and in particular interviews in a laboratory conference about experiments, talking about the experiments she'd done, was impacted by her disability. And one mandatory module was called Practical Physics 203. The module, um, as it's referred to throughout the case, had this conference element as part of its assessment. And as I've already said, she died on the day of the presentation of her laboratory conference. Next slide. She was in her... Um, second year um, and if we could just pop onto the next slide thank you very much there was no cause for her as a concern when she was a child she did very well in her GCSEs and A-levels and indeed she had a part-time job in a supermarket her first academic year passed without incident she lived with flatmates in her second year and um, in her first year they were aware that she suffered from social anxiety but no evidence before the county court and therefore since you don't have fresh evidence in the high court no evidence before the court at all of any significant stresses in that first year. Her average marks at the end of that July 2017 year session was that she was at the level of a 2-1 so she was clearly not struggling in her degree. 
In her second year, she moved into a different flat with people from her course, including her lab partner, and her lab partner um, became romantically interested in her, which caused an additional source of tension and indeed an altercation with Natasha's boyfriend. Next slide, please. In her second year, she spoke about self-harm and an issue arose um, in relation to the marking of an interview assessment. It was conducted in a large the lecture theatre and, and effectively she didn't speak, she didn't say anything um, in the course of that assessment. Academic staff became aware of this problem and began to exchange emails with concerns about Natasha and attempted to contact her to discuss this. Uh, now, discussions began, including Natasha and the University of Disability Services, uh, as to how she could complete her work that year, including this interview element. And there was evidence of a degree of inflexibility about the presentation element of the course from at least one of the academics. The university was also made aware that Natasha was self-harming, although the circumstances again around who and what knew what when are not entirely clear from the information and the transcripts we've seen and the university identified that the end of year interview would be a significant pressure for her and that was known uh, before it arose. So in terms of escalation, there was a clear escalation and things have been escalating in respect of Natasha's presentation. There had been two significant attempts at self-harm which included asphyxiation by suspension. The university were not aware of the specific attempts and as I've in, in, indicated already there was some ambiguity as to whether particular conversations took part and took place in the contents of those conversations uh, from the judgments that we have seen but clearly there was an element and degree of knowledge um, about um, the problems that Natasha was facing and that they'd led to self-harm. Now, whilst the university appeared to be aware of the relationship between stress from giving the presentation and that aspect of the examination, and that that was linked to Natasha's mental health or her declining mental health, she was not offered an alternative means or method of examination. And by the time of this 30th of April 2018, because she'd missed the number of presentations in the run up to this final one, it was clear that she'd be unlikely to pass the year, have enough marks to pass the year without having some marks from this lab conference presentation. Now, indeed, Ms. Abhart didn't attend that conference on the 30th of April 2018. And at around 2.30 in the afternoon, shortly after it had started, she was found dead in her bedroom. At the inquest, it concluded on the 16th of May 2019 that there was suicide contributed to by neglect. Ian will take us in greater depth into the inquest in due course. But at the time of the, her death, she'd been under the care of the local trust mental health team. But they had failed to provide a detailed and timely management plan in respect of her mental health. She'd been prescribed sertraline, but the NICE guideline had not been followed in respect of follow-ups by the mental health team or indeed by the GP. There was a prevention of future death report made in respect of the trust, um, and there was a civil claim against the trust that was settled in pre-action, leaving only the claim against the university. And now we're going to come on to the Statutory Act um, implications of that judgment, and Steve is going to tell us about those. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, Emily, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I echo Emily's uh, words at the beginning of the presentation about the terrible circumstances of this case and anyone reading the judgments uh, and, and certainly reading them in the detail we've been reading them preparing for today uh, can't fail to be affected uh, by them. Uh, just to emphasize a practical point, please do use the Q&A function uh, that you have uh, on your screens. Uh, Ian, I, I think, is going to gamely try while I'm talking to uh, go through that at least. Um, and we'll do the same for each other, I'm sure, at different points in the talk. So it's an opportunity to interact with us as, as we're going along and also to put questions that we can take together at the end as well. So the, the substance of the judgment, uh, both in the, in the county court, but also in particular in the high court, Mr Justice Linden's judgment, is very much a judgment about the Equality Act. And it's also very much a judgment about reasonable adjustments. And, and I've cited there uh, from paragraph 140 of the judgment, the finding by the judge that the duty to make reasonable adjustments is likely to be the beginning and end of many disability discrimination claims and the present case is in this category. So I say that uh, partly then as a justification for why I'm only going to talk about the reasonable adjustments duty in any detail. It's an extremely lengthy, uh, typically full judgment from the judge and it would take me more than the time we have available in total to do the full uh, Equality Act issues justice. I will just mention that in relation to the claim uh, of discrimination arising from disability under Section 15 of the Act, 
where the judge found that in essence, because there had been a failure to make reasonable adjustments, there was also a breach of section 15. There's a very interesting uh, approach to the question of knowledge and the judge making a, a very rare, he describes it as rare, finding for himself um, of the date on which knowledge was deemed to have accrued such that there could be a breach of section 15, which was different from that found by the court below. So on that one specific point, there was a change in the judgment of the High Court, but not a, a, a change in the result. The claim, um, the, the fact that the claim had been allowed on uh, grounds of indirect discrimination under Section 19, discrimination arising from disability under Section 15, and the breach of the reasonable adjustments duty, all of those were upheld. All the grounds of appeal against the uh, decision below failed. So if we look at this from the perspective of the reasonable adjustments duty, and if we look at this from the perspective of those of us who practice in this area and who do lots of disability discrimination claims, in my case, very often involving schools, I'm going to suggest that none of this is particularly surprising or controversial, that really this is a very thorough and very detailed uh, exposition of some fairly well-established principles uh, to and, and, and the application of them to uh, an extraordinary and very unhappy set of facts but that the result really of the application of those principles, in my view at least, it was extremely predictable uh, when you see the analysis that the judge goes through. So the reasonable adjustments duty is imposed on universities by section 919 of the Equality Act, all references here of course is the Equality Act, uh, and then schedule 13. And it's really important in any reasonable adjustments case, of course, to identify the relevant schedule of the act and to make sure you see exactly what it is that one must do in relation to whom. Uh, the relevant uh, requirement, people may be aware there are a number of requirements within the reasonable adjustments duty in section 20, is that in relation to PCPs, provision, criterion or practice, uh, the very broad concept, essentially things that are done by a duty holder uh, and where a PCP puts a disabled person at a substantial disadvantage in comparison with non-disabled persons, the duty is to take such steps as are reasonable to avoid that disadvantage. So there's a helpful summary at paragraph 153 of the judgment of the questions that then need to be asked and answered in any reasonable adjustments case uh, in relation to the PCP uh, requirement. What is the PCP? Of course, it's absolutely fundamental to properly identify the PCP. Does it put a disabled person at a substantial disadvantage in relation to relevant matter in comparison with non-disabled people? And if so, importantly, what is the nature and extent of that disadvantage? So it's not binary. We need to understand how bad it is from the disabled person's perspective in order to then answer the next question. And this is the question people often jump to, but it's really important to only get to this, the third stage third, which is what are the steps which is reasonable for the duty holder to have to take to avoid the disadvantage? Those questions don't mean that a defendant need not take any steps if they would not avoid the disadvantage altogether. Another very important principle. It could be reasonable to take steps which would mean to reduce the disadvantage or where there is at least a real prospect that the adjustment will make a difference. See the Pauli case in the Supreme Court. So it's, again, not an absolutist approach. And this is then very important, I would suggest. Who, uh, to whom is the duty owed? Schedule 13, like many of the other schedules, specifies uh, that the reference to a disabled person under Section 23, in our case, is to disabled persons or students generally. And as, as Justice Linden said, the effect of this is that the duty to make reasonable adjustments in relation to these matters, including provision of education, may be owed to people who are not known to the educational institution before the issue arose in, related to them, in relation to them. And that's why it makes sense to describe the reasonable adjustments duty as an anticipatory duty. Uh, the well-known uh, case of roads and central trains, or just as Sedley uh, describing it in that context, saying, the duty holders are required to think about and provide for features which may impede persons with particular kinds of disability, impaired vision, impaired mobility, and so on. Again, not an absolutist approach. It's not a requirement to anticipate all the potential needs that may come along, but a, a at least a reasonable level of anticipation is required. And whether the failure to anticipate the particular disadvantage resulting from a PCP does or doesn't result in a breach of the duty will depend on the same circumstances which inform the reasonableness question, i.e. whether it's reasonable to make adjustments to it. So you're getting the sense, I hope, that the, of the fairly nuanced uh, approach that needs to be taken 
in these kinds of cases. Knowledge, there is no specific requirement, says Mr Justice Linden, again, I would suggest uncontroversially, that the responsible body knew or ought to have known of the claimant's disability or its effects because it's an anticipatory duty. But what the further or higher education institution knew or ought to have known about the student or prospective student will be relevant to the question whether it was reasonable to take a given step or steps. So knowledge is not um, a foundational requirement in the same way as it is under Section 15, but it's one of the factors, and I would suggest often a very important factor in the reasonableness analysis. And equally, there's no requirement for the claimant to have identified contemporaneously what adjustments ought to have been made. The duties on the institution in this case to identify adjustments that might help. But if you're bringing a claim, by the time you get to the stage of arguing it out in front of a judge, you need to have identified uh, those um, adjustments. And whether you've identified them contemporaneously is going to be relevant to whether it was reasonable for the defendant to take the steps. Of course, if you're specifically asked to do something, you may find it rather harder to defend um, the reasonableness of not doing it than if it was something you might have thought of for yourself. So this is my point about the, the need to plead your case, unsurprisingly, by the time of the hearing, the claimant has to have set out their case as to what adjustments ought to have been made. And there must be at least some evidence of an apparently reasonable adjustment from which the court could conclude the duty was breached. But then if there is, importantly, applying the very important provision in Section 136 of the Act, the burden of proof shifts to the defendant to prove the duty was not breached, i.e. that any reasonable steps were taken, and or that the, the other steps were not reasonable ones, because those are the two potential defences, aren't they? Either we did do it, or anything we didn't do was not something we, we should reasonably have been required to do. In this case, as in many other education cases, a question arose as to whether there was an excluded competence standard in play. And that's defined for the purposes of reasonable adjustments only, importantly, uh, paragraph four of the schedule. So we see that the PCP does not include, cannot include, the application of a competence standard. And that's defined as an academic, medical or other standard applied for the purpose of determining whether or not a person has a particular level of competence or ability. And that wording is very important because you need to, un you need to look very carefully as whether, as whether something is a competence standard or if it's a method of assessing competence. Which, which can be subject to the duty to make the adjustment. So it's the standard itself that is not a PCP that can be uh, required to be adjusted. And this only applies to the duty to make reasonable adjustments. So even a competent standard, something that is properly understood to be the measurement of whether or not a person has a particular level of competence or ability, uh, can still be indirectly discriminatory. Uh, it's quite a helpful confirmation, I'd suggest, of that. And that analysis, again, helpfully and clearly set out by the judge, a standard which is being applied to measure whether a person has a particular level of competence or ability cannot be required to be adjusted, even if the disabled person can't meet that standard because of their disability. And the, the policy reasons for that, I'd suggest, are obvious. But on the other hand, because this exclusion is to be construed properly and narrowly, methods of assessment of standards of competence are in principle subject to the duty to make reasonable adjustments, which might facilitate the person's ability to demonstrate that they've met the standard. So the standard doesn't change, but the process of assessing the standard can be required to change. And that is critical, I'd suggest, to the success of this claim. And there's a helpful example. Um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission intervened in the case, and a number of the points that are in the EHRC technical guidance were discussed in some detail, uh, some, some with a greater degree of approval than others, I think it's fair to say. And this is one that was cited with approval by the judge from paragraph 7.35 7 of the technical guidance. So a requirement that a person completes a test in a certain time period is not a competence standard unless the competence being tested is the ability to complete something within a limited time period. So you can see that, can't you? Um, if we're assessing whether someone can write a, um, a good essay about history, then whether they can write that essay in one hour or three hours is not directly the competence standard. The competence is, can you write a good essay about history? But if you're trying to assess whether someone can write a good essay very quickly, then the, uh, the time period can itself become part of the competence standard. 
So, it's, so that's why we have this emphasis in the judgment at 183 of the standard being the thing that cannot be required to be adjusted, distinguished from the method of assessing whether that has been um, achieved. So um, these are the relevant questions. Again, very helpfully set out for the judge uh, by the judge at 186. What competence or ability is being measured? Absolutely fundamental. If we don't understand that and we are, haven't asked ourselves that question, then we're very likely to get lost in the weeds on this issue. We have to identify what it is that's actually being measured here. What are the standards that are being applied to determine whether a person has met the relevant level of competence? For example, is, is there a pass mark? And what aspect of the process and methods of assessment of whether those standards have been met? So that's now very clearly what we need to look at in any competency standard case. And then from 187 in the judgment, we have the application of these principles to uh, the facts. So the, the relevant PCP was being was identified as being the requirement to be assessed orally by way of the laboratory interviews and the laboratory conference presentation, including the format, structure and venue for the assessments. So that PCP, we can see framed in that way, could only be a competence standard if delivering the thing orally was part of the competency, was part of the thing that's being measured. And the judge found the fundamental purpose of the oral assessments was to simply to elicit answers to questions put to the student and that such a process does not automatically require face-to-face -face oral interaction. It followed from the judge's findings of fact, and of course we all know that it's very difficult to challenge findings of fact on appeal, that the laboratory interviews and the conference were not a method of testing proficiency in oral communication presentation, nor were they a competence standard for oral communication in themselves, and nor, therefore, was this a case in which the competence standard and the method of assessment were inextricably linked, because that was part of the consideration. If, if in fact, you can't separate the standard and the method of assessing the standard, then it will be excluded. The judge's findings as to what was being tested, knowledge, not oral communication, were an important part of the context whether it would be reasonable to remove the requirement for a face-to-face -face interview. And it was common ground that this PCP existed as alleged and that it put um, Ms. Abrahart at a substantial disadvantage in comparison with persons who are not disabled and therefore the duty to make reasonable adjustments arose because it wasn't the competence standard. Importantly, for the judge's um, consideration uh, on appeal, the university didn't submit that the adjustments uh, proposed, including simply dispensing with the interview and the presentation, were out of the question or inherently unreasonable. The argument instead was that due process uh, had to be observed and there was a lack of sufficient evidence available to the university to justify making them. So essentially, that had to I'd go, I'd suggest, to the question of whether it was reasonable in all the circumstances for the university to do these things. The university argued and argued that it was reasonable to require proper expert evidence in the form of uh, uh, medical evidence, for example, before taking steps that had the effect of reducing the rigour of the academic assessment. So not um, trying to argue a total exclusion by reference to competence standard, but relying on academic standards more generally to say it's not reasonable for us to change the process without uh, proper expert evidence. Uh, it was necessary for the university, it was said, to identify the source of Ms. Abraham's difficulties and to receive recommendations as to the changes that should be made. This was said to be a matter of fairness to other students and necessary in order to maintain the academic integrity of the course. So that was the case being put by the university. And the judge said it was implicit in that case that it didn't have sufficient knowledge, the university, in the sense of expertise or expert evidence to be required to do more. And so the judge had to assess, sorry, uh, whether taking into account the level of knowledge and the lack of medical evidence, uh, the failure to make the proposed adjustments was reasonable. It was obvious, and the judge clearly knew, that uh, Ms. Abrahart didn't have a definitive diagnosis at the time. The cause of her mental health issues was not fully known. But there was never a suggestion by the university that, the, uh, that Ms. Abrahart didn't genuinely have issues with her mental health or was anything other than genuinely unable to cope with the oral assessments. The duty to make reasonable adjustments is concerned with the effect of the PCP on the disabled person, of which the judge found the university was aware. 
a precise diagnosis, and this is really important, I think, would no doubt have been of interest, as would an explanation of what had caused her mental health issues. But these considerations were not of decisive importance under Section 20 in terms of the reasonable adjustments duty. Once it was apparent there was a genuine issue with Ms. Abraham's mental health, which was affecting her ability to meet the requirements of the module. So no requirement for any formal diagnosis. And the attempt to rely on the university's own processes uh, was fairly resoundingly uh, dismissed, I'd suggest, by the judge. Not cogent reasons for the failure to make reasonable adjustments. The problem, and, and I think this will echo um, the experience of a number of us who practice in the schools field, the problem with the university's reliance on its own regulations and policies was that they are not the law. They were subject to the law, including the requirements of the Equality Act. It didn't follow that for the purposes of Section 20, it would necessarily be reasonable for the university to insist that its processes were followed. An argument that the university follows, must follow its procedures begs the question of whether those procedures ought reasonably to have been adjusted in the circumstances of this case. So it would be very dangerous for any institution to place too much weight on its own processes uh, to seek to avoid an argument that it's failed to make reasonable adjustments. Uh, there was some criticism of the judgment below. The judge could, for example, have dealt with each of the proposed adjustments in turn and considered the likelihood that it would be effective. But in essence, Mr Justice Linden cut through that, said the most extreme step of advocated by uh, Mr Burton King's counsel for the claimant was abandoning the requirement for oral assessments and assessing Ms Abrahart by written work, which would have included uh, her ability to communicate via um, text messaging, WhatsApp messaging. Uh, there was no dispute that this would have avoided the disadvantage which Ms Abrahart was experiencing. The only question was whether the university had satisfied the county court that for the reasons which it had put forward, this was not a reasonable step to take. The judgment of the court on the facts was that it hadn't done so. So actually taking the claimant's case at its highest, the university had failed to discharge the burden of, of establishing that it was not a reasonable thing to do, to simply dispense with the requirement for oral assessment altogether. And so that's why, in essence, uh, the reasonable adjustments claim succeeded, because there was nothing uh, the university could point to that meant that any of the statutory exceptions from that duty applied, whether it was because that what was being um, contested was a, com a competent standard or because there was uh, an adjustment being put forward that was unreasonable in all the circumstances. Uh, on the contrary, the county court was entitled to find and did find that the adjustments that the family were arguing for would have made a difference. They would have avoided or at least reduced the disadvantage that Ms. Everhart was experiencing uh, and they uh, were reasonable or put the other way, the university had not shown that they were not reasonable. And so that's why uh, in this case, the reasonable adjustments claim uh, survived the appeal as did, as I mentioned at the beginning, the other claims under the Equality Act. And so as, as it was rightly described uh, by Emily in opening, uh, the statutory tort claim succeeded uh, throughout those stages of the process. So I'll now hand back to Emily to look at the um, areas of the case that where there's perhaps more controversy or certainly uh, more going to be more exploration, I think, than there was in relation to the Equality Act, where, again, I would say the uh, findings of the judge are entirely orthodox. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, yep, it's me again, and then we'll move on to Ian for the, the, the cherry on the top, so to speak, and talking about the public law and inquest side. So I'm going to talk about the duty of care and the civil law, and I, I think it's probably no spoiler, as Steve's already given, that this is the unsuccessful part of the claim, uh, but possibly the area where there is more, more interest or perhaps more nuance to be drawn from the judgment, uh, because we have a completely straightforward um, succeeding Equality Act claim. But the um, civil law claim is not straightforward. Um, it's important to look back at the claim at first instance, because obviously this was on appeal to the High Court. Um, the claim at first instance being Aberhart and the University of Bristol. The judgments were uh, not um, published in the usual way, uh, but can be found um, by a simple Google search looking for the case now that it's been appealed, they are available. Um, and um, on the slides, you will also see the references to them if you have any difficulty locating them. Uh, but essentially, um, His Honour Judge Walton um, gave the first instance judgment um, on the tortious claim and it failed. Now, that was then subject to appeal and therefore it was a cross appeal um, in the High Court and therefore fell into consideration again. Uh, but it's important to go back right to the beginning and the pleadings to understand what that duty of care was alleged to be. 
and the duty of care was defined in the original pleadings as a duty to take reasonable care for the well-being, health and safety of its students by the university. And in particular, the defendant university was under a duty of care to take reasonable steps to avoid and not to cause injury, including psychiatric injury and harm. Now, of that duty of care um, uh, definition or, or, or pleading, the only controver non-controversial part of that is that the potential injury um, can include psychiatric harm or indeed uh, be exclusively psychiatric harm because there's no bar um, to an injury claim being psychiatric harm only. However, what is the case is there does need to be a recognised diagnostic of that psychiatric um, injury. Um, so there does need to be a real psychiatric injury that can be defined. Now, it was described by his honour Judge Walton both as a novel claim and as a common law duty for which there was no precedent. Um, so that immediately sets an uphill case to climb um, and indeed an unorthodox um, um, claim. So was there a duty of care? Now, we have to, again, look back to um, that first instant judgment because um, um, it was being appealed, um, its failure was being appealed. Um, so Abrahart, Dr. Abrahart, the, 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 um, Natasha's father, relied on the university's provision, its active provision of learning and indeed welfare to support to show that there did exist a duty of care um, to Natasha. And indeed, we've seen some of the um, scaffolding of that um, welfare support um, in the um, cases we've already indicated the um, support that she was being um, that Natasha was being offered both by the welfare services and to some degree by um, her the academic staff as well who are raising concerns about her health her mental health and so on and so forth um, and all of that um, um, both the scaffolding that was present and indeed the action that was taken was said um, by the Abrahats to show that the university had assumed a responsibility for the health, well-being and safety of its student body. So in effect, the um, argument was said that where A provides B with a service uh, to address any issue, and um, here welfare support, then A would be assuming a duty of care to protect B from that issue in the first place. So by providing welfare services um, to Natasha, um, the, 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 the suggestion is that the, the, the allegation is that the university was then assuming a duty of care to protect um, Natasha from the very concern in the first place from the outcome of her mental health problems. Uh, now, effectively, on the next slide, we see and um, if we can go on, please, Steve, um, that this is essentially a breach by omission. Um, the, the principle being that the um, university did not need, did not change um, uh, the need to give a presentation. It didn't take any action to prevent Natasha being in a situation whereby um, her, her, her mental health problems became overwhelming or indeed worsened. I mean, one doesn't necessarily need to um, anticipate the extent of harm that may be caused, but the um, the knowledge of and um, presentation of, of harm arising um, is, would be sufficient. So the fact that um, the university still required Natasha to give a presentation. The fact that she was penalised in marks for not having given presentations, and that had already happened on a number of occasions uh, before this final presentation, uh, she'd been given zero marks for not speaking on other presentations. Um, and there was a th these combined um, to show that there was a failure sufficiently um, to address her mental health and to the impact on her mental health that these requirements had. Um, and indeed, there was um, also an allegation that Miss Perks, who was um, part of the uh, welfare team, had not informed Dr. Barnes um, of the disclosed by Natasha via her friend um, of her suicidal thoughts on indeed her preparatory and, and, and her actions um, when th there was information uh, by a, a, an email of the 20th of February 2018 um, and the uh, um, elements of what was informed and to whom and to how much... Uh, duty of care arose from that particular knowledge um, was an area that it was alleged that gave rise to a, a breach of the duty of care that, as I say, was set out by the uh, claimant in the particular claim, set out by the Aberhart family in the particulars of claim. Um, 
So all of these things add up overall to there being a failure to take action or be proactive um, in the protection of um, Natasha's mental health, having offered that scaffolding of welfare services. That's the um, element of the claim. But it is effectively a breach by omission. It's a failure to take action, to take an anticipatory action. Um, now, breach by omission is something that can be difficult to comprehend or to, to get your head around, but it's very well set out by Lord Reed and Robinson and the Chief Constable of West Yorkshire Police. So essentially, um, the breach, uh, a breach by omission is something that the common law does not tend to impose uh, because liability is generally imposed for causing harm rather than for failing to prevent harm caused by other people or by natural causes. So here it's being said there should be a breach by omission, a failure to prevent harm caused by natural causes or by other people. So in this instance, caused by Natasha to herself. Now, that's a breach of omission where gen generally liability is not imposed um, for the failure to act. So when is there a duty? On occasions, there can be liability for omissions, um, and they arise where there's a voluntary assumption of responsibility to prevent harm when it's an, akin to a contract. Um, and it assumes a status that it carries a responsibility to prevent harm. So when the defendant has a status or has assumed or taken on a status that carries with it responsibility. But that's a much higher bar generally than simply being the provision of services. Um, uh, instances where uh, that duty is assumed um, are where you have a parent or where you have a parent in loco parentis. Um, but the omission arises where the defendant has acted so as to create or increase a risk of harm in those instances. Um, and though the question here is whether there had been a voluntary assumption of responsibility to prevent harm or whether there had been a voluntary um, assumption of responsibility and the defendant had acted so as to create or increase uh, that risk of harm or whether it was simply an act of omission, a failure to prevent Natasha taking steps herself. So on the next slide, was there an increased risk of harm? Well, there was nothing inherently unsafe in the teaching of the course. Uh, it, there may have been particular concerns for Natasha under the Equality Act, as we've seen, but in the course itself, there's nothing inherently unsafe in its teaching. Um, and so essentially, the argument has to be in this common law duty of care, uh, that there was a duty on the university to protect Natasha from herself. Now, Natasha was not in the care or the control of the university as she would have been. Um, she's an, in her adult state. She's not at school, nor is she an adult where um, her power to look after herself has been removed, where there's been a voluntary as assumption of responsibility for taking care, which generally arises, for example, when somebody's a prisoner of the state or in some circumstances in medical treatment. But those situations were not at play here. Um, and most cases arise where there's a very particular relationship uh, between the person who's assumed um, that duty to prevent harm by omission or not. And in this case, there isn't such an assumption of responsibility. Analogy was drawn by uh, those arguing the case for certain other situations. But for example, stress at work, and that's a particular line of cases, that's followed the assumption of a duty of care within an already well-defined employment relationship, where you've already got employer-employee, a defined duty of care, a defined responsibility, and then you can play through that stress at work following that duty of care. But if there isn't already that duty of care in place, it doesn't become imposed uh, in a case such as this. Um, let's um, look at the next um, slide. So overall, uh, in the county court, uh, the judge held that there was no duty of care um, imposed. There was no assumption of responsibility um, in the same way as you might have had at school or in local apprentice. There was no removal of agency um, as you would have in a prisoner situation. And therefore, you were just left with the common law sense of, of, of failure by omission, a breach of duty of care by omission. Uh, and that didn't apply here. Now, <clears throat> the cross appeal effectively was never articulated or argued or considered by the judge because uh, the Equality Act findings were upheld and therefore it didn't become relevant. Therefore, strictly speaking, <coughs> the comments in the judgment are obiter. Um, you can find them from paragraph 268 onward. 
Um, but they are interesting um, because it gives us some clues as to where the arguments may follow through um, in the future, because this is an area um, that is still, I suspect, ripe for further consideration. Um, the claimant, as in the Aberhart family, had argued um, that the, the judge finding at first instance there was no duty of care in Abraha ran contrary um, to a case that was decided uh, around the same time of Feder and, Mc and McCamish against the Royal Welsh College of Music, so Feder and McCamish and the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama. Uh, but actually, in, in, in my view, they're, they're not really analogous. I mean, that was a case um, that the College of Music was found to owe duties to both a complainant and the person complained about when investigating a sexual assault allegation. So that was a student on student incident. And the um, allegations ranged around the way in which um, the College of Music investigated sexual assault, the way they did or didn't protect the identity um, of, of the person complained about, the way they did or did not um, protect or offer to support during the process that they themselves were running looking into sexual assault. Now, I, I, I think that's actually quite a different type of situation. I don't think it's um, easily analogous um, because you've got a process that is being run by the university to which it obviously has to um, run a process in a fair and transparent way uh, that is even handed um, um, uh, 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 and transparent and protective for all those um, participating in it. Uh, and I think that's quite a far remove uh, from here, a suggestion that the university was required to adopt responsibility for Natasha to prevent Natasha doing something um, uh, that would harm Natasha herself or prevent harm befalling her by failing to act to protect her. It's a very different situation. Um, they also pointed to the fact that within the university's UK guidance, um, they quite openly talk about a duty of care when dealing with allegations of misconduct, duty of care owed uh, by the by the university, duty of care owed. Blah, blah. But again, I think it's a, a little uncomfortable to try and use guidance and then turn it into having a very strict and precise legal meaning, which it obviously does have within this the context of a claim, uh, trans, transposing wording um, from a different circumstance and then trying to use that to demonstrate a duty of care, I think is problematic. Um, I've set out again there, the um, those are the uh, references to um, find the other cases that you can look up in, in, in your in your own time, the Federal and McCamish. Um, now, um, Mr Justice Linden made no response to the allegations, as I say, because uh, he, the, up, up, he upheld the Equality Act finding. Um, uh, but possibly a framing um, of adoption of responsibility would be something that would be open for investigation. So just finally, a couple of areas where I think it might uh, look to further uh, argument, um, and then we'll move on to um, Ian. Um, essentially, uh, Mr Justice Linden recognised that this was an issue of contention and, and of significant concern, both within the case and also within the wider uh, within the wider society. Um, but he also said that uh, in the in the um, first instance, the judge had said, well, I don't make there's a finding of duty of care, but if I did, um, I would uh, import uh, the duty breach for exactly the same reason as the statutory breach, which I found, the one that Steve has been explaining to us. Um, uh, uh, Mr Justice Linden said, you simply can't do that. You just simply can't Im import a, a, a breach that's under the statutory breach and use it as um, ad idem with um, a common law breach that would need to be argued. Also, and it's unclear from uh, the judgment, there had been certain um, concessions about causation that had been made uh, at, at, at the first instance, which again weren't properly articulated or judged upon because of the failure and they would need to be properly argued. So it's not an easy jump from one to another. And I think it's probably also further complicated by the Supreme Court's recent ruling of the decision in XXA and, and YXA, which are important um, emission cases. We can't go into them in depth now, uh, but effectively they upheld how wide um, the... Um, uh, the rule is that there is not easily a duty uh, by omission. Um, those were cases when a local authority failed to remove children uh, from a home situation and when they later suffered harm. Um, and those were not held to be situations in which the local authority um, had a duty to act 
Um, there are many, many reasons why you might think that that children, duty of care, being responsible for them in all sorts of other ways would make that likely. And I suggest that if they don't even succeed, the university situation is going to be uh, much harder. As we know, uh, Aberhart's claim succeeded because of the Equality Act and the disability that um, she was under, as Steve's explained. But the more general duty of care is absent and, and I don't see it easily coming into play uh, in later claims. So that's something that's perhaps open to wider discussion in due course. But for now, I want to move on to the safeguarding points and hand over to Ian. Thank you. So it's it's really interesting picking up after Emily and, and thinking about how the duty of care works in universities in respect of mental health. Because when you start to look at safeguarding duties at university, uh, some of you who are here today from a social care background and some of you who are here from universities yourselves will be thinking, having heard Steve and Emily talk, well, what about safeguarding? Uh, and I've been doing safeguarding cases now at universities uh, probably for the last decade. And to be honest with you, they come in waves. So when I first started dealing with safeguarding duties at universities, it was primarily in respect of societies. So how student societies operated, things like hazing and so on and so forth. And then after that, the evolution in respect of safeguarding really came with the Me Too movement and how universities dealt with allegations and concerns around sexual harassment. And some of you will be familiar with the 2016 Changing the Culture Report, which talks about specifically how students are treated by their peers and how they're treated by other people working in a university setting. But one of the strange things about safeguarding duties at universities is that there is no real core guidance that sets out what is the scope of that particular safeguarding duty. And it's interesting to speak about Feder and McCamish just for a moment, because in Feder and McCamish, that was all about sexual assault. It all followed on after the 2016 report and guidance. And still within the judgment from that particular case, there were still points that the judge had particular concerns about. The recorder had identified that there were issues in respect of the university's policies and whether or not they were clear and comprehensive. There were issues in respect to whether or not there were effective processes and there were issues on top of that in respect of staff training. And again, that's one of the things that features when you read the judgment at first instance in the Aberhart case, and indeed, when you read the appeal judgment as well. And from experience, uh, comparatively, compared to other settings, for example, schools, faith organisations, Safeguarding duties at universities are, are very, very differently expressed by different institutions. So some people focus entirely on the sexual um, abuse aspects. Others are more widely drawn policies that think about things like prevent and so on and so forth. Uh, but not all universities even have designated safeguarding leads. And there is no sort of core policy. There's no sort of precedent policy that people can follow. So arising from that is different universities running different systems, looking at different concerns in respect of safeguarding. And on the next slide, I start to talk about some of the, the difficult points that exist. And when we were preparing for today's um, seminar, one of the conversations that we were having was in respect of data sharing. So data sharing is a is a huge issue in respect of safeguarding and, and not simply between um, universities and, uh, and schools in lots of other different contexts. But here, one of the really interesting things that we're sometimes asked to advise upon, and I know Steve's been asked to advise on this before, as have I, is the extent to which schools can share information when somebody who has perhaps an EHCP, so um, additional needs uh, at um, at a secondary school level. How much information can be shared about that person onwards towards the university? Uh, and one of the interesting things in that regard is that there is a slight concern in respect of data protection as to 
the extent to which people can share information. And it's something that the ICO has been really trying to sort of explain to people and how the safeguarding exceptions work in respect of the Data Protection Act, but it's still not entirely understood. And again, it's not entirely something that people um, have conversations about or, or will actually explore and go and get advice about. And likewise, one of the other perennial issues uh, and one of the um, sources of contention between universities uh, and parents of students who are attending them is the extent to which information can be shared about a student's presentation with their parents. And again, sometimes you find there are conversations about concepts, again, around data protection, but also around confidentiality. And again, there is perhaps something of a misunderstanding as to the circumstances in which information can be shared. It's not right to say that you can you simply can't share anything with a student's parents, especially if they're going off um, from university, having had a difficult time and they're going off onto the university vacation and so on and so forth. And that then combines with those of you from a social care background, um, how it works if you know somebody before they goes off, they go off to university is actually going to have. Um, some sort of care and support needs, be it either under the English legislation or the Welsh legislation. Uh, because at that point, when somebody already has those care and support needs, perhaps around their mental health, there can become issues in respect of which local authority is doing what. So there is still, and some of you will be familiar with this, that there is still argument and there are still scenarios within the Care Act guidance at least that talks about the fact that care and support needs may be met by a particular um, local authority, even though somebody's moved to an entirely different part of the country. And in that entirely different part of the country, there will be another local authority who has a responsibility for safeguarding. And one of the really interesting facets and features when I'm involved in university cases is that there are very few universities who think about making referrals to statutory services from a safeguarding perspective. So in this particular case that we have just dealt with, one of the things that could have happened is that a referral could have been made to the local authority in respect of safeguarding. I, I can't tell you if it happened or not because it's simply not something that featured within the judgment, but it is something that, that could have happened. And it could have either happened from the university itself or from one of the health providers who was involved in Natasha's case. So, so one of the real issues here is about routinely sharing information, but routinely sharing information with a view that there may be a pre-existing condition or a pre-existing care and support need that needs to be recognized and considered by the university and that information shared with them. And again, although that's something that features within the Care Act guidance, the idea that there will be, as part of a transition process from children's services to adult services, that sharing of information with the university. The sad reality of the situation is that we, we know that very rarely happens. So when it comes to safeguarding universities, the, the two sort of pinch points are information sharing and having a mechanism to involve a statutory service who has a core safeguarding duty. So in this case, involving a particular local authority and how that mechanism works. Moving then to inquests, because obviously um, there was an inquest in Natasha's case, and we'll just pull up the next slide. Um, one of the questions um, I was asked uh, ahead of preparing this particular seminar was, well, is there going to be a particular impact on inquests? And I think the answer is probably safely no, that there is nothing in particular that comes out of this case that impacts upon coronial practice. One of the things that's interesting about this case, though, is that it does reflect, as I've already alluded to, this ongoing issue that features in lots of different inquests, in lots of different settings, about how information is shared 
And then that information is dealt with in such a way so as to identify risk. And again, one of the common features in, in inquests in, in lots of different types of setting is how you pass that information on, how that information is then processed to put in place some form of safety plan for a particular person to avoid harm coming to them. One of the sad things looking at the um, prevention of future death tracker is that there are inquests that take place at universities and there are circumstances uh, in which uh, unfortunately and sadly that students do die by suicide uh, and one of the interesting points perhaps and with parallels to the current case is if you look on the PFD tracker one of the things you'll find is the death of a third year university student from the University of Southampton Matthew Wicks and within the Prevention of Future Death report, you, you get a sense of Matthew, although not a, a massive sense, it's not a long judgment like Abrahart, um, but you find out that he was neurodiverse, you find out he was having academic issues in his third year, you find out that the, the pandemic had an, had an impact on his life and how that had played into his neurodiversity. Uh, and one of the findings that the coroner made was that there was a concerning lack of awareness on the part of the staff working with him about neurodiversity issues. But one of the other really interesting things that goes into what everyone's been talking about today, what Steve and Emily and I'm talking about, is this notion that there is a requirement that academic staff need to have a level of curiosity around the mental health of students. And that's really interesting because that's distinct from what Emily has just said. And that's distinct from what Steve said, because they're talking about this sort of pure, um, a, a pure illegal concept. OK, uh, what the coroner is talking about in Wix is something much more akin to a safeguarding duty. So those of you familiar with safeguarding duties will know that the expectation is in respect of safeguarding is that professionals will show curiosity when there is something potentially wrong. And that in itself, that form of curiosity, is a means for protecting people. So on the next slide, um, I segue into the concept of scope. And all of you who are involved in coronial practice will know that um, scope is a broad concept in inquests. It's effectively the issues that a coroner is looking at in a particular case. And one of the things a coroner can do is look at how it is that a person died. That's actually a requirement of the Coroners and Justice Act. And how in a non-Article 2 inquest means by what means. And so that means that a coroner is able to look at the background and determine whether or not any of the facts involved were or were not causative of death. And there's an expectation that we're not simply in inquests looking at physical causes of death but also potentially looking at something that might have exacerbated a mental illness. So whilst we, we think very specifically about the legal duties under the common law and also uh, under the statutory regime under the Equality Act, one of the things that might happen in an inquest is that the coroner, when considering whether or not somebody died by suicide, may look at what the deceased intentions were, and they may consider whether or not there were active steps in respect of a particular person's mental health. So um, on the next slide, in Natasha's case, um, one of the findings made was a neglect finding. And it's just worth saying and flagging at this stage that neglect means something very different to negligence. Uh, neglect has a narrower meaning. It talks, uh, the House of Lords in Jameson talked about uh, there being a position of responsibility that somebody has taken over someone. And in the Jameson case, it was again in the prison context. And there has to be somebody who is dependent and there has to be a gross failure to provide basic care. And again, that remains a very high bar. And there has to be a clear and direct causal connection between the conduct described as neglect and the cause of death itself. So whilst we may not get to the threshold in respect of negligence, and there may not be 
an Equality Act issue in a particular case. If it is shown that somebody is dependent on a university for some form of care, it is still arguable that a neglect rider might be placed by a coroner on a conclusion. So whilst um, I was perhaps slightly dismissive when people first asked me about whether or not I thought this case would have any impact on inquest, and I said, well, I don't think so. And more I think about it, more there is a chance that it might. And likewise, one of the things that I expect coming out of Natasha's case, which can only be a good thing, is that the concept of safeguarding universities will broaden further to consider the impact of a student's mental health on them and I hope will start to be the genesis of conversations about getting in place those practices, those policies and staff training so that staff feel able to have that professional curiosity into why a student's mental health presentation may have changed. Thank you very much. I think, Ian, just picking up on your last point, I think it's very interesting that the coroner and the inquest provision found no difficulty in assuming a duty of dependency which you have to have as a precursor for neglect mm. and and they had no difficulty in finding that Natasha was essentially a dependent on the university and and you know the great um, neglect is described with those that don't know, as, as, as provision of basic care, you know, food, water, really basic, profound human needs, yeah. um, which has then been extrapolated. And I think it's really interesting that the coroner found no difficulty in putting that very close connection and responsibility in place, whereas in the common law context... Um, there wasn't even a more wishy-washy, so to speak, a duty of care generally to, you know, act as a reasonable university and the provision of reasonable university sort of things, um, uh, which is a much broader type of duty of care. And that wasn't held to be to be present. Um, and I wonder, just flipping it around, listening to you, one of the difficulties that you see with acts of omission or or omission types of tort are uh, all the things that one's talking about with safeguarding of um uh that, that actually the university has very little ability to control or make happen yeah absolutely um, and and i know steve's going to answer some of the questions that we've we've been asked but in looking at you know assessing mental health and how do you if you see someone is having difficulty you can't ensure that they get the help they need you can't make them access medical help you're not in that position of control no. to make it happen so i think there's a real tension in you know quite what your dependency might be what the responsibilities may be that aren't easily answered i think it's really interesting as well because in in natasha's case because the way in which coronial decisions are framed of course it just it just says um suicide contributed to by neglect but of course, in Natasha's case, there was also these other secondary mental health services involved and the GP involved. And yeah. there was, you know, there's this sort of overlapping mesh going on of all these different actors who were required to provide services to Natasha, not least the university. And so from a sort of coronial and a safeguarding perspective, you, you see this sort of web of people working together and you see that dependence forming. But as you say, and um, there's no real duty necessarily to hook things onto that that sort of one can point to in a statute and say, right, this is your responsibility in these circumstances, university. But there is this sort of expectation that processes will be in place where information can be shared and that somebody, once they've got the information, knows what to do with it. <laughs> and that goes back to the real basic point earlier about, well, uh, if we're if we're saying the university has to do something with the information, the easiest thing that I can see that's often missing from university policies is uh, notifying the local authority who has the statutory responsibility in respect of safeguarding. Yeah, fair point. Just to chip in on that, I think it's really interesting to associate that safeguarding obligation in under the Care Act with university students. Mm -hmm. And clearly it's right. Yeah. It's not how people normally behave, is it? Oh. Um, you know, the Care Act is seen as being, well, it seems probably being an act for older people, frankly, but where it's seen as being an act for anyone younger than um, than uh, of old age, it will be seen as being for people who are disabled in a much more typically and traditionally understood sense and, and need 
care and support in a way that might be understood as being a care home place or supported living or something very specific. But of course, that's the whole purpose of the care it was not to be about those things exclusively yeah. and to be a much broader um, piece of supporting legislation for anyone with additional levels of needs. I think that's a really interesting area to, to explore. I just wanted to touch on a couple of the questions that are really helpful, really good questions that have come in, and thank you for them, everyone. Uh, there's definitely, uh, understandably, some interest in the competence uh, standard issue. Uh, I appreciate why that's going to prove so, um, so so much interest to this audience. The key question, I think, is there's a couple that have come in that are very similar. One is, uh, is it how likely the universities will massively specify standards? e.g. in curriculum descriptions, including, for example, timescales, to ensure they will be protected as standards and not methods of assessment. Uh, and on that, I think the answer is they may try, universities may try, but they'll need to be very careful because the competence standard must have the purpose of determining whether or not the person has a particular level of competence or ability. And you can't disguise something as a competence standard if it is, in fact, merely a method of assessment. So I imagine the courts will be uh, quite astute to any attempt to dress up a method of assessment as a competence standard. Uh, linked to, to that is, does it need to be one or the other? So an example that's given is a mandatory moot in law school, that, where you would get marks for both presentation and also the content. Uh, I agree, that's a situation where it may be completely impossible to meaningfully distinguish between the method of assessment or the uh, and the standard, or where it could be said that the method at least to what to some extent is the standard. Uh, so I think, again, as with all uh, these kinds of situations, everything will turn on the particular facts. But that distinction and the questions, again, with great thanks to the judge, we know what questions need to be asked. Uh, and that set of questions will have to be applied to any particular facts to determine whether something is an excluded competence standard. Also, watch out for the fact that your competence standard could still be indirectly discriminatory. And I think that might be the next area uh, that's explored is the extent to which even standards which universities would hold very dear or other institutes would hold very dear in terms of uh, actually being the level of competence we're looking for, whether that could itself be indirectly discriminatory. So we'll see if that goes anywhere. Uh, the only other question I thought that it might be useful for me to answer generally about the Equality Act was the point about diagnosis, knowledge, so on. Uh, we know that disability means a long term impairment, etc. Uh, is self-reporting enough or would it be appropriate for universities to ask for evidence of this from a medical professional? Well, that was, of course, one of the key issues in Abraham. And uh, the, the thrust of the judgment is that it's not acceptable for universities to require any particular type of evidence. Uh, the, the processes that the, the University of Bristol were seeking to um, rely on didn't provide uh, any kind of defence to the reasonable adjustment claim. Having said that again, in another case, it may be that the university simply doesn't accept the person's disabled. And, and it's, as usual, the burden is on the person who asserts something to prove it. And so you may need to prove it uh, with certain evidence, including medical evidence. But there's no absolute rules here. So I thought those were perhaps points that might be of general interest from the questions. Well, thank you very much. I'm conscious of the fact it's now 10 past six. So um, if there are any other particular pressing qu questions, please do feel free to email us and we'll try and deal with those. Uh, once we've uh, well, I've had a couple of typos we noticed on the slides going through, we'll load them up for you all to have as well to look at at your leisure. And it simply remains for me to say thank you all very much for giving up your time. Um, uh, Stephen and I very much enjoyed having an opportunity to talk at you, talk to you today um, and look forward, hopefully, to seeing some of you in person at another event soon. Uh, and thank you very much for your time today. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye bye.